uh, the text. Uh, with the rise of Islam, uh, Arab civilization was given a um, defined uh, ideological and cultural framework within which it uh, could develop. Uh, Islam as a system of symbols uh, represents the most uh, significant factor in the explanation of Arab uh, cultural, uh, intellectual and literary um, uh, history um, since the 7th century. Uh, Arabic literature was never only a religious one, but since the revelation of the Quran um, and the various um, activities uh, in the literary system generally uh, occurred within the borders def defined by Islam and were guided by the, uh, a cultural heritage that seems nearly as uh, sacred as the religious law. Islam, and I'm quoting now, I'm quoting uh, Professor Ruben Sneer from the University of Haifa, and more specifically, the Quran was also predominated uh, dominated and uh, um, considerating uh, principles uh, that ensure, according to most of the intellectuals in the uh, in the 20th, uh, 20th century, the modern Arabic literature could only be a direct extension of the classical literature. The dominance of Islam's discourse in the literary system during the last century and now, and even in the uh, medieval century. Um, the domination of Islamist discourse in the literary system uh, during this century was reflected through censorship and banning of books for uh, religious. Um, they also tried to uh, run away from harming, harming uh, the public immorality. The second um, Note is news broadcasts uh, serving the Arab world reflect uh, harsh pictures uh, illustrating the daily experience of residents of Arab uh, country. These news items can be can only be seen as Kafkaian, like Kafka, Franz Kafka, uh, showed in his his in his stories. Uh, alienation, the absurd, despair, death touch upon the basic element of offering everyday life of the Arab person. The Arab man and woman in Arab countries live the life of continuous despair, uh, the rip of um, basic human rights and um, uh, oppressed, oppressed by uh, rules of men and also the rules. The, uh, this war uh, of the Arab citizens, um, I think, should make us uh, think about what is going in the future level. And, uh, I think that literature reflects, in any way, the reality and tries sometimes to even make it more, or make it better. These texts that uh, I gave to you, Nuri, uh, for my opinion, recognized the illness the sickness of the society and recognize the symptom of something bad is happening here, even in the uh, 13th century and more now. Uh, as the text above uh, demonstrate, the authors were not connected with 
simply knowing about things, nor with following a particular way. Although many writers have characterized them, those authors, for example, as great, uh, Ibn Arabi is a Sufi, mystics, and um, Mahmoud Darwish is a national, uh, nationalist uh, poet, and Jubran is uh, flying on the air. Um, but um, they, 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 see, they, they see them as firmly rooted in the into Islam world. Uh, it would be wrong to limit um, their appeal to a Muslim uh, and Arab audience. Uh, naturally, they express uh, themselves within the cultural uh, context they knew. But they take for granted that their readers will have the same unflashing, one-pointed attitude of passion for the truth. And their writings have a very contemporary ring. Um, reminding me of uh, the words of Amberto Eco about hermeneutic process for the text, I want to read for you now uh, something about uh, that was written about um, 18, eight, uh, 800 years ago. All that is left to us by tradition is mere words. It is up to us to find out what they mean. This sentence wrote uh, Ibn Arabi, who have, uh, have who you have here in, in the text. And I think that Umberto Eco have to have to, to see this and say that I didn't write about hermeneutics process, but Ibn Arabi um, came before. So Ibn Arabi gives us the uh, opportunity to understand words, not just in the Islamic context. Uh, it would be um, little, um, um, limit message to Muslim in, 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 in any strict sense, unless we were to took the word Muslim in its literal uh, meaning. The universal character of their teaching makes them um, superlatively, superlatively, uh, no, okay. uh, superlatively um, appreciate to the present day, for my opinion at least. After reading, um, that's my opinion also, after reading these texts and many others, I think that we can read everything differently. Everything differently. So, um, Rita, would you please read the first one for Ibn Arabi? Oh, marble, a garden amidst the plains. My heart has become capable of every form. It is a pasture for gazelles and a convent for Christian monks, and the temple for idols and the, and the pilgrims, Kaaba, and the tables of the Torah and the book of the Quran. I follow the religion of love, whatever way love's camels take. That is my religion and my faith. Um, would you gentle please read the, the and the earth is yours? And the earth is yours, consecrate liberty, so that the world's depots don't rule you. You all stand together before the face of the sun. What remains after the combat of two? What remains after the combat of two titans? Ash, blood. Ash where the reapers were, blood where the peasants were, and where lovers hugged, you find the bodies of two soldiers. Why? Why, if the earth is yours, the earth is ours, the earth is yours. Why then, you fall out with me? Why then, why? Why do I not hear, nor do you see, but we long to reach each other out? So here's my hand, 
Here's my hand, give me yours. Give me your hand. And Jeff, please, the third one. <clears throat> As you prepare your breakfast, think of others. Don't forget to feed the pigeons. As you conduct your walk, think of others. Don't forget those who want peace. As you pay your water bill, think of others. Those of, think of those who only have clouds to drink from. As you go home, your own, think of others. Don't forget those who live in tents. As you sleep and count the planets, think of others. There are people who have no place to sleep. As you liberate yourself with metaphors, think of others, those who have lost their right to speak. And as you think of distant others, think of yourself and say, I wish I were a candle in the dark. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, my role here is uh, to discuss these texts with you and see if uh, those texts and other texts that uh, we can derive from the Arabic, modern Arabic literature and even classical Arabic literature can be a, a base for global learning. And um, uh, because in my opinion, it could. Uh, it could be, and uh, I think that uh, reading the literature of another culture, another nation, uh, makes you feel the hidden uh, uh, human uh, uh, symbols that um, gather all of us. Now, um, if you uh, look uh, at, the, at these texts, there is no mention of Arab or Muslims. Oh, yeah, Ibn, Ibn Arabi, but not in the not in the mean of this text uh, or this text was written for Arabs or for Muslims. It's a, a text that dialogues with the human being whoever he is. So I, I would be more than uh, happy to hear your uh, opinion and to discuss this uh, text with you. Um, I th think of others. You know, you know Mahmoud Darwish, No, I don't. Did you hear about him? No. Okay, this is very important to say that Mahmoud Darwish is a, as, as written here, is a Palestine uh, that uh, um, his character uh, um, seen in the world as the Palestinian poet. Uh, he's, he's also he, he's always uh, writes. Um, <laughs> Uh, national uh, poetry, um, just to know. So you're saying his, his emphasis on national, he's known for his national poetry, but this appears to me to be very universal. Okay. I mean, I, I'm reading it in, the, in that context, and I thought how interesting that it resonates so much in terms of the current Syrian crisis that we're now experiencing, not just for Syria, but in many places. But Particularly, it's applicable and contemporary and relevant to the moment. Mm -hmm. you know, how about, that can be used as a very strong tool to take into a classroom and begin to open up this conversation, drawing in multiple texts, multiple resources, to find that common ground that Moshe and all of us have been talking about. Where do we start? How do we initiate this um, conversation for teaching that's relevant to the student that will resonate to them and gets them to listen and quicker to participate and to begin to, to learn? So I, I found that very useful. Okay, thank you. I want to just know that uh, this, the, the, the point of Ibn Arabi, uh, I'm not so sure, but I want to say something like that. If someone else wrote this poem in that time, but not even Arabic, they will kill him. This is the Shaykh al Akbar, the big master. He said here things, uh, not about Christianity.
street you're Jewish, but, but also uh, uh, people that uh, uh, do not recognize God. Uh, for me, this point is uh, very different. And when I, uh, I realized that uh, Arabic literature, classical has in it a biting um, um, word, a universal word. This is not for Muslims.
the commonality between their biographies, you think about it, a narrative comes out of human experiences. And so I look at these three biographies and see individuals who all share a common characteristic of, of being what, say, Erasmus would have said, you know, I'm not a citizen. I'm a citizen of the world. I'm not from Holland. I mean, there is a sense of being cosmopolitan, but we're individuals who travel around the world, create a world view that's polyglot because they use all of those experiences. I think that's vastly different than the conservative, Hasidic rabbi who lives on Bergen Street and won't move from their neighborhood, or the Islamic imam who lives in a neighborhood that everybody is the same. I think part of the contrast, or Catholics who are you know, so, so immersed in their own little monoculture, so people grow up in an intellectual ghetto. And when, when you live in your own intellectual ghetto, excuse the, the analogy there, but I, I mean it literally, we grow up in, a, in an epistemology that we think the world is like our little neighborhood. And if you always live in that neighborhood and every place you go is the same, you think the whole world is like that. And so that's a very different biography. I don't think that this poetry could come out of that. But I think when you have people that have experienced this more cosmopolitan view, then I think that's when you start to realize you can see the universality. But if you go to someone who was, was musician, I mean musician, so you go to Ireland, and you grew up in this little village of Ireland, and you play these 50 songs for the whole of your life, you become a master of those 50 songs. And you can play them and make a lot of money. But once you go on the internet, you realize there's 3,000 songs. But if you, were, you know, if you only grew up in this little culture, then you would basically say, I know exactly what it needs to be played. So it is. Yeah, I mean, right, exactly. I mean, so, so it seems to me that, that that, to me, for us, is, is, is a key. Because in education, like Plato would say, you've got to get people out of the cave. They're sitting in their little seats. They're watching the wall. They're watching the shadows. And they, as long as they stay there, they think they know reality. But reality is bigger than that. And so when you first stand up in the cave, you get everybody upset. Because now you're rocking the boat a little bit. You know, so when I read the third poem, I don't get the idea. I guess it, there was a time in Delwash's life when he was a radical communist. And as a, and as probably a real friend. Radical, it's, you know. Uh, but, but I mean, he doesn't say, this is not a communist poet. Right? Uh, we could all get communist poems that all fit the same mold. And we could get evangelical Protestant poems that fit the same mode. We can find literature that's in these clusters where our group is against all the other groups. But I think your theme before of, of, of finding the other and realizing that the, the seeing who you make the other, you know, that phenomenology, who you construct as the other, has a lot to do with us as educators because people all have these little heuristics in their mind of who is the other and, and what they are like. I remember my friend John's not here, John, John Spitzer, when he first moved to Cincinnati and he was a student in a, in a rabbinic university, he, he lived in a neighborhood and he said, Larry, I, I went to throw the garbage out and my neighbor was staring at me. I went to walk my dog, my neighbor was staring at me. And finally one day I got so upset with him, I said, why do you keep staring at me? He says, I'm just amazed that you people do the same kinds of things we do. If you walk your dog, you put the garbage out. I mean, that's a mindset. That, that, that I think we see all in many different spheres. And, and breaking that heuristic structure, I think, is what education is all about. And that's why these poems become important. But, but in and of themselves, they're not the agents of change. Because they're the product of someone who's already cosmopolitan. And our job is to take, how some, hey, take somebody who's encapsulate and unencapsulate them so that they see other things, speak other languages, sing other songs, read other poems, and realize they can do that without violating themselves. So, sorry. Well, Thank I you very much. And yesterday, we were in Rita's uh, classroom, um, me, uh, Moshe, and Rafael, we talked to the girls. And uh, one of the things that we, I realized that they are so paid, so in their course of, like you say, I, I, say, I, I asked them if they read any uh, of the other uh, nation books and they say no. Uh, do you know what Nazareth is? Um, she said, I heard about it in high school. That's what. Mm -hmm. And it's so, so narrow. 
So it's, it's a circle. But I mean, that could be replicated in any city. You could go to Africa, you could go to Prague, you could go to Damascus, and you will find people that think that the only thing they know about is what they know about, and the rest of the world doesn't matter. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that's that's the edu to me that's the challenge of education. For how what do we create to make that experience that that breaks that cycle of encapsulation? And that's that's the thing to throw in. I mean, so some things work, some things don't work. Um, interestingly, uh, one of my classes a few years ago, we had Shlaheem here in, in town, and I had. Um, there were, there, were, there were some Muslim, Arab Muslim visitors. And I had the Shlaheem, the Arab, and a, a young man who in town who was Jewish who was driving them around. I had them come into my class. And I had them stand up in front and I said to the kids, who's, who's the Israeli, who's the American, who's the Arab, who's the Jew, who's the Muslim, who's the Christian? They absolutely had no idea because they were dressed as stereotypical what our kids in the United States think. You know, they, they, they think Israel, they, whether they think Jew or Arab, they think camels, desert. They, they don't understand what's here. This kind of thing would be wonderful because when our students here, and I've, I've had experience only with students here in Israel, but when they, at this point, think about Arabs or Muslims, they don't think peace. And I think it would be an absolutely a wonderful way of, of breaking stereotypes. Just like we have to break stereotypes about um, commonalities between other religions. It's very, very important to do this kind of thing. I, I just want to add, too, I, to me this is just its a vehicle to get us started. I mean, mm -hmm. this is what Larry was saying, and then what you were saying about visiting Drita's class. I mean, that with this project, and I keep thinking, I know Larry's posted several times about Sunday when we can really look at what we do next. It, it, to me, this is just such a wonderful, beautiful way to start. And it's that whole idea of looking me at the, the other and looking into the eyes of the other so we get to really know each other. I mean, I can learn about you from Uganda, but if I don't meet you and know you, you know, and so, you know, although we want to try to get all of our students to be able to physically go places, with technology we can, we can go places also, and we need to do both, but we need to have conversations together about poetry like this or literature. I, it's just such a great starting point. But commonality is, is where we have to go in, it, it, with kids, I mean, it, that's, that's how it begins. One of the things we do is, um, when I, I talk to kids, I give them a little bit of background about Judaism before they start studying the Holocaust. And in background about Judaism, I say, get out a piece of paper, do me a favor, write down anything that I say about Judaism that you have learned in your church. And they, all of a sudden they start writing, they're writing, they're writing, and say, why do you think we have so much in common? You know, wh where do we learn to love your neighbor? Where do we learn to, to give charity? Where do we learn to be hospitable? Where do we learn to honor? Your... It's, it's all in the same, all our children, we want that of all of our children. Whether they are Jewish, Catholic, Christian, Muslim, whatever. And the background is so important before we teach them. Um, Raquel? Um, I'd like to say that uh, when, uh, we were actually using literature in the inclusion mm -hmm. and, and course, but in, in literature serves as a mirror to what we think and what we go through. And it also serves as a window the other, learning about others. So I think the use of literature is written in their own words is an, a good need to learn about the other and in a way start to develop an empathy towards the other's experience. So it's a mirror for what we we are going through and I mean one of the goals in, in multicultural education is really to go across the bridge to the discovery that the other is you or me. And when we can get our 
evidently, we're not all the same in terms of commonality on every single level, but there is an essential quality of being a human being and that humanity that we must discover when we, when our eyes construct an image, we have to see ourselves as, as, as the way the other person is seeing us. That's what we do. The bridge has to, we have to be able to cross that bridge. So that we know that someone else is looking at us, they are in essence seeing who we are as we are seeing them. And that, that's when we can really kind of have a dialogue. Um, I think that one of the things that are really important to emphasize that um, I don't think personally that um, they could write these poems, the authors, without having um, a conciliation, inner conciliation in, in their sense. Because I think that they are not denying their sense, but they have the inner conciliations, a conciliation with, the, with them, with themselves, that they can tell the other. I'm here, I want to see you, I want to recognize that you are exist. And I think that uh, this, this is um, a basic thing to emphasize in, in our project here also, the inner consolation of, of ourselves. Another? I have a quick question. Is Darwish, is he in relation to Nani Darwish? Is that, a, or is that a, just a common name? Who? There's a, a female writer named Nani Darwish, and she wrote about um, something about being an infidel. She, she. No, no, no. no. I, I no. was just wondering. No, 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 no. He didn't marry them. He has no. Okay, I'm just curious about it. No. Thank you for. Oh, just one. Um, picking up on a comment back here about cosmopolitan. Um, I think there is a bit of a difference between cosmopolitan and homeless, but not homeless in the sense of not just lacking a home, but having no home rootedness, I guess would be a better word that I would use. And in Darwish particularly, I see that dialogue going on between the person who has no home rootedness and the person who has a home rootedness. I think that that's a level on which you can connect with uh, uh, with younger people in a classroom setting. I, I've, I worked for about 25 years with uh, uh, juveniles who were incarcerated, and I've read a lot of their poetry, which is sometimes incredibly dark. I would not see this as a difficult piece for them to produce, but not in the incarcerated situation. But when they get out of the incarcerated situation, I would see them expressing themselves not unlike this. They tend to separate from what they see. You know, I have, I do not have this home rootedness, but other people do. I don't have ties, other people do. Going back to what was said last evening, that uh, you know, one of the one of the characteristics of Holocaust teaching is. There is no rootedness. There is no personal history tying tying me back because the grandparents' generation has disappeared. And I would see in Darwin a, a reflection of that, very gentle reflection, but certainly when you go behind what he's saying, that seems to be a very strong element and could be a point of contact. With, well, actually, a lot of kids probably even on this campus, you know, who who by and large are going to have supportive families and so on, but many of them feel no home-rootedness. They don't feel any personal history, and that can be part of their, uh, their drawing into themselves and seeing their little world as the only world. Uh, so it could be a jumping off point for instructing them with poetry like this, since poetry is, as was said a few minutes ago, intensely personal. Figure out where the personal is coming from, you might find the same personal as existing in the minds of, of a 
considerable number of the people that are sitting in front of you in the classroom. Thank you. I would like to continue with this uh, line of talk about the people who remember your name. Jack Polly. Yeah. Thank you, but uh, I mentioned yesterday a dialogue that is getting on this time between being a, a cosmopolitan or a person of the world and being a person of one place. I mentioned, for example, George Steiner, who said that people, the trees should have roots, but people have legs that enable them to be guests at others' houses. And we are now in Israel, he was saying, playing the game of yesterday, placing our own home and our own fortress instead of opening the gates to the other. And on the other hand, I mentioned Jana Marie, who said, who well, asked how much home does a person need? And he, he answered, as much as he can get, because genuine creativity appears not in the world, but in your own home, your own homeland, your own language. And there is no universal person. Humanity is an abstraction. You speak Hebrew, or you speak English, or you speak French, or you speak Arabic. They, but the, the classic Jewish dream was to be a, a person of the world, then to leave, leave behind all the differences between the cultures and the traditions and the faiths. For example, the great invention, invention of the Esperanto, one language for one humanity. Oh, idea of Isaiah, one humanity, one justice, one language, one God, and all those differences are, yeah. are left behind. Now, I believe that today we are not so naive as Steiner is, and we believe that we have to find a way to recognize the differences in our identity, <coughs> and at the same time to recognize the, legit the legitimacy of different identities, or different traditions. And not to be so afraid, not to see the tradition of the other, the Quran or the, the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament as a threat. For example, uh, the pastor took his class to Jerusalem a few weeks ago, and uh, one of the students wrote me and him a letter saying that he will go to Jerusalem, but he cannot enter the church. Remember that case. Can we, I go with you to Jerusalem, but as a Jew, I don't want to enter a church. Because I'm not, I don't feel that I can enter a church. And the same, the threat of a, of a mosque. And, and so on. And can we come to a place where the traditions of the other will be something that will enrich our worldview and not will be a threat? And I believe this kind of a poetry can help us to enter the world of the other with not saying that we are all the same, we are different, but still the other is not a threat and that the Christian other is not trying to convert me or the Muslim other is not trying to Islamize me or to kill me or something like that and take it in any direction that, that, uh, that you want. And can we make literature, Arabic literature, English literature, Hebrew literature, as a vehicle to, to achieve such a post-universalism world? Where can we live together, not living behind our separate identities, but still see the, the different colors as an adventure, as enrichment? For example, we teach the Galilee, the Galilee culture at, uh, at our college. You know, we are the Galilee, and the Galilee have Christians and Muslims and Jews and Jews, they're living together. And we found out that when the Christians are traveling in the Galilee, they see the Christian Galilee. They don't see the Muslim Galilee. And when the Muslims travel the Galilee, they just see the Muslim Galilee. They don't see the Christian Galilee. And when my Jewish students travel to Galilee, 
they see your fat, they see it's a fat, they see Tiberius, but they don't see now. And they don't see, they see, but they don't see it. They don't hear the stories that's coming out of Nazareth and Kafarkana and, uh, and other places. And for example, people, Arabic people of Shefa'am, when they talk about the history of their town, they refuse to recognize that 2,000 years ago, it was a Jewish town. And they start with the Arabic invasion to the, to, to the area. And they say Shefa'am has a, a, Arabic origins, the name. And I tell them that the Shefa'am is a genuine Hebrew name, they know. It, it, it's impossible. So can we make literature as a big group of, of taking all the tradition that we have around us as an opportunity, as uh, human creativity, as human adventure? And uh, there was a time when Arabic culture served as a bridge between, between different worlds. And hopefully it will be again part of Jewish philosophy the most important part of Jewish philosophy was written in Arabic. Well, it was a genuine Arabic literature. Maimonides is an Arabic literature. But still, it is also part of our tradition. So that's why I asked uh, the series to, to open the door for such an adventure and opportunity for us. I think that, uh, oh, we have a time for your kind of. Let's see. Yes, Thank you. Okay, I just want to add something maybe different from, at least from a different point of view. Um, when, I, when I read something like, I wish I were a candle in the darkness, um, it, it sounds to me like someone who knows what's right. around, he believes that he knows the truth, maybe, and he want to be the candle. And I think this um, point of view is a bit arrogant to me. And uh, I think if we really want to know what's going on around us, and if we really want to understand people around us, from different cultures, different religions, whatever, uh, we should uh, adapt um, uh, Wilfred Bion the, the British psychiatrist point of view that said that in order to see something, we need a flash of darkness. <laughs> you really but you know, you know, mm -hmm. it's a, that candle burned itself. Sacrifying itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, now you should ask yourself if that's our mission in life to sacrifice ourselves no, in order to. <laughs> or to understand the others. Or to show the way. Just show the way, maybe. I, I just want to you know the way. I don't think I know the way. No, I don't know, but I'm just trying to understand yeah. the image of the candle. What does he mean? What do we want him to... What do we, 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 we mean? Heart in Arabic language, in classical Arabic, is not just the heart, it's also mind. Mm -hmm. Just know. Mm -hmm. Just know. When I see uh, the, the verb qalb, yeah, qalb is heart, yeah, when I um, use the verb I think, I think, uh, we refer it to um, a group of of verbs that call the uh, verbs of heart. When I, like think, it's to, to feel and also to know. Just just be aware of this. That's my that's my point. I think as educators, I I, I will experience art because let's let's call it art because literature is a form of art because music, I mean, dance, many of these things, sculpture can lead to these kinds of open bridges. I like the idea of a window and a mirror. Many of these arts can do that. Uh, but when I switch my gears, I have a good friend that was here. Uh, he was actually lived in Jerusalem many, many years. Uh, he's passed away since, but he was a philosopher. He was a student of Thomas uh, Hobbes. 
So he was a positivist, very clearly. But one of the things that, that Martin used to say, Mickle used to say to me, was that he was an artist as well. But when he sat down to do philosophy, philosophy wasn't exactly the same thing as when he was an artist. And, and I used to disagree with him, but I actually stopped to agree with him more. Because when I hear this conversation, I want to say, what opens my eyes and what might open a student's eyes is the hermeneutic that's Arabic. The phenomenology that's Arabic. Because I can think, well, we have an experience. If I'm going to have a hermeneutic, a way to interpret something, or if I'm going to have a way to describe it, that's, that will be not necessarily contentious, but that's going to be unique to who I am. And if I grew up in New York City, as opposed to growing up in Canton, Ohio, and living, I'm going to have a phenomenology and, and an heuristic that's slightly different. Doesn't mean that it's better or worse. It means so. It seems to me that what we need to get to are the Jewish hermeneutics, the Jewish phenomenology of those, the Galilee. Because each of those students were doing a hermeneutic and a phenomenology at the same time, but they were doing different ones at the same time. And if we as teachers think there's only one phenomenology and only one hermeneutic, we're just making a mistake. It's just there are more cultures. I mean, years ago, all of these people, one of the common things they had from the early Greeks to just about maybe 1850 or so, was that there was one culture. And there was one real culture, and every culture was measured against that. That's why the Greeks knew who the barbarians were. That's why the Romans knew that the Roman culture was dominant and everybody else was not. We've really moved to an age where, where which you realize that there isn't one dominant culture. There are many cultures. There's clusters of cultures, each having truth, each having value, each having aesthetics, each having humanity to it. Now you get into a whole different kind of interpretive process that wasn't the one that the, 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 the you know, it, it, Jewish philosophers and the Christian philosophers and the Arabic philosophers in 1300 didn't deal with these problems. There were problems that were that priests that were antedated them. They were dealing with problems of, of, of metaphysics, they were dealing with problems of causality, and many of those problems they had common bounds. But in the, once you get into the 20th century, ours is now a problem of, of global hermeneutics global phenomenologies. And that's what needs to draw us together to kind of decode, because in Africa, if you grow up in an African culture that's not affected by the West except as a colonial power, you're going to have a different set of hermeneutics and phenomenology about how the world's put together. And so we need to hear these different voices. And yes, the voice of someone raised in a middle-class American city would be different than someone who's raised in a middle-class Arabic city or in a middle-class Jewish city. But the point is, once they start trying to understand what is that phenomenology, how do I explain that? How do I describe it? How do, what are the categories I use? That seems to me that we, what we have to, the, the, the work of us as educators is to start pooling that together and realizing that that's how windows and doors open up. Because you start to see, oh, that's how you interpret that, or that's how I interpret that. Oh, there's the connection. And making those connections are, are I think, what, what insight would be or what judgment produce more insights, not just repeating what was done before. So I think this is excellent because I think it leads not just about the literature, but unless you include phenomenology and hermeneutics to it, 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 it completes the picture. Thank you. Uh, um, do, you have, do you have anything to say? Um, no, I want to... Anyone? When I look at uh, uh, these uh, uh, writers, uh, it seems to me that uh, the kind of conviction they, they had to write this, uh, they had undergone some kind of stages which I was trying to analyze. And I think that the first stage in this is to, first of all, to acknowledge that the others are there. Mm -hmm. And then after knowing that the others are there, the second step is do I understand them? Mm -hmm. And once you can understand them, the third step is do I accept them? And if you can accept them, then the last stage should be value with them. So it appears to me that they have gone through that kind of uh, fourth stage you know, appreciation of the other to this kind of uh, right that they have. One of these interesting things that's evolved just in our first experience was we began to identify, and we'll talk about this much later, but I, I just it's relevant right now. What we discovered was it takes time 
for people to begin to move into this inner circle where they can begin to talk and, and language becomes so essential and then they have to, they, they need time. So when we start building these courses, especially with the video conferencing where we're accessing multiple cultures, we have to intentionally design a curriculum that allows people to have time to begin to become acquainted. We can't do this in four weeks. We can't do this in maybe a semester. We can begin it in a semester, but we need to extend it. And then we need to travel in each other's communities, whether we travel virtually or we travel uh, physically. But that's something we need to think about, because you don't just get to snap your fingers or read a poem or have a cute little talk or video conference to get into this real work of knowing and being the, the self and the other. Okay, and that can I have to add something. Not, not only it takes time, it needs courage. We're talking about courageous dialogue. Yes. Because we are very sweet here, we're loving one each other, we're hugging one each other. But do we deal, do we take into consideration our core texts? The texts that we have in our hearts, intellectual or emotional, that define for us the other. And each one of us, in its own tradition, has this text. Whether it's in art, whether it's in an icon on the wall, whether it is a word in our prayer book, whether it's something we say in the, the mosque uh, square, what is the Jew for us, what is the Christian for us, from, what is the Muslim for us, what is the Goy, the Gentile for us. This is a very heavy, very difficult word definition. I can speak as a Jew. The Hebrew word for Gentile is God. It's a very, a very concept. It's not a neutral sociological term. When the word Jew is not a neutral word. I used to, once I had, a, when I wrote my dissertation, I used a, a spell checker I bought here for all the in those days in DOS. And uh, whenever I reach the, the, the program with the word you, it flashed and said, try to avoid this word, it can be offensive. <laughs> the American program I bought in the software, I forgot, I forgot the name of this uh, program. For Walter, that's what, uh, what I used in, in, in those days. But the word you, the word Muslim, the term in Jewish language, in the, in the Holocaust, to the word Muslim, and the word Christian, and the word, word heretic, or other ugly words used in different culture. Can we dare to touch our core texts? Not only these beautiful songs, this is a poetry, but what is said in when we are trying, what we are saying, what we are, how we are. If we're all in Africa, we get, most of us would be the same. And it's Asian And when we, and when we have the courage to retouch, re-examine this text, then we can really be with the other without fears and, and so on. Yes. I don't think that love is something that would be, we should be ashamed of. Like, love is just, just a romantic idea. And when, um, when, I bring, when I bring these texts, I know I, I'm, I'm, I'm so deep in the reality of the Middle East. And I think that I know that in the Middle East and other, other spots of the world, there's a lot of evil and darkness and whatever. But I, sh I think that in education, in global learning, we should be stick to the common. And I don't think, I don't think that we should be shy 
to say to other to, to our uh, pupils that love is, exists here because love is not something that we uh, we we, uh, uh, we we can't we can't live without love. I want to read for you something that Jubal said. You are my brother and I love you. So cliche. But it's essential. I love you when you uh, prostrate you, uh, yourself in your mosque and kneel in your chair and pray in your synagogue. You and I are sons of the faith, the spirit. And uh, uh, Julian Thompson, one of the Jibran's uh, uh, researchers, uh, say, say uh, that Jibran wasn't going to sleep before he uh, meet with, uh, uh, um, with the Baha'i uh, um, Abdul Baha. And he's not a Christian. Not an Arab. Uh, so uh, when Jibran say that, say that I love you, I, sometimes you, we may say that this is not reality. Um, okay. If you want to deal with the reality, I, I don't think so. I don't think that uh, I would be here, or you would be here, or the others. And um, I have a question for you, please. Did you ever hear a um, song in Arabic? Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to give the, the second uh, text another dimension. For your ears, for your soul, for your heart. Mm -hmm. Fairuz, the big singer, sings Jubra uh, Khayyu uh, uh, this poem in Arabic. Mm -hmm.